Hey guys, it's probably only, the, I'm going to show my stereotype here. It's probably only the guys who are going to remember this, but if some ladies do, that's fine too. Who remembers the Heidi game? The Heidi game. Got one. Who remembers the Heidi game? Football. Yeah, it was a football game. But there's something special about the football game. Yeah. The Heidi game happened in November of 1968. The Oakland Raiders were playing the New York Jets in Oakland, California. The game started at 4 and was supposed to end at 7. Because at 7 o'clock, NBC was premiering their new movie adaptation of the story of Heidi the little girl in the Swiss Alps. There was a minute and five seconds left to go in the game. And it went to commercial break. And it was seven o'clock. The Jets were ahead 32 to 29. And the decision was made to preempt the game and start the movie. Guess what? They came back, and in a minute and five seconds, the Oakland scored twice and won the game 43-32. to 32. And there was such an uproar that you would not believe it. For those of you that remember the game, you may remember that the network actually published an apology for stopping the game. <clears throat> You look on Google and you put in a Heidi game and you will get all kinds of hits. It is an infamous football game to say the least. And I had said I was watching it. But I was really wanting to see Heidi. Because I wanted to see how it was going to go with the Shirley Temple Heidi. So it was interesting. But the network actually came out and uh, apologized for it. Our topic today is time. And football has a lot of things that deal with time. This is one. Don't cut the game short. We also have the two minute warning. Um, coaches get called for time management. We have extra innings in baseball. We have extra time in soccer. Time's all over the place. And today we're looking at session number nine, which is Ecclesiastes chapter three. And the title of the session is What Time Is It? So session nine, Ecclesiastes three, What Time Is It? The book of Ecclesiastes deals with a lot of things. Got the outline over here on the wall. It's somewhat autobiographical in tone in that King Solomon is talking about his investigations. Good, it cut off. Um, his investigations into what is the purpose of life. And very early in the book, in Ecclesiastes 1, verse 3, he states the general question that he's going to explore throughout the book. And that question is, what does a person gain for all of his efforts that he labors at under the sun? Put it in a modern vernacular, what use is it? If you remember last week, the title of the lesson was, what use is it? All the work we put in, all the things that we are concerned about, all the things we look for, for the meaning of life, what use is it? Well, this week we're looking at the first 15 verses in chapter 3. And it's probably the most familiar of all the verses in Ecclesiastes. The particular passage talks about the seasons of life. And it's been used, or parts of it have been used in different secular literature. They've been used in theater productions. And they were even a top 100 
Bill Ford number one hit in 1965 by a singing group called The Birds. If you remember The Birds, you're like me. You like the oldies but goodies. The song was called Turn, Turn, Turn to Everything There Is a Season. And when we talk about it today, you'll recognize the lyrics because the lyrics of the song are literally the scripture verses. In Ecclesiastes 3, Solomon's going to talk about the different seasons of life, and he's going to talk about how they affect people. So, uh, keep wanting to say Ephesians. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, starting at verse 1, and we're just going to read them all. So, Beverly, I know yours is New International, mm -hmm. so let's start with the New International, and then um, Francis... I want you to do the King James when she finishes, and then I'll read from the whole one. I like that combination of translations because you get a variance in words. Can so verses one through, one through eight. One through eight. Okay. Yeah, which is the song? I don't have to sing it, do I? No, you don't have to <laughs> sing it because I'm definitely not going to sing it. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter storm, stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. Okay. Hmm. Francis, uh, King James, please. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. Okay. From the whole one, verse 1 says, There is an occasion for everything and a time for every activity under heaven. Now, notice here that mine says occasion. Yours says time, I think. Yes. What does yours say, Francis? Season. Season. Okay. In these next eight verses, Solomon is going to set up 14 opposites, if you will. The opposites are kind of looking at the seasons in a person's life and things that can happen in a person's life. They're not intended to be all-inclusive, but they're intended to be a good uh, look at the different things that happen in a first person's life. And the term that is translated in my occasion in the New International, it's time or season, we're not talking about chronological time. The word that they're talking about here when they talk about there's a time under heaven, they're not talking about a time like what's on our watch. The word actually means an appropriate time for something to happen. I hate to use time in there, but this is something that will happen at the appropriate instance. So, for instance, as it starts off here, it says there is an occasion for everything or an appropriate time for everything and for every activity under heaven. And what Solomon is starting off here telling us is who controls the appropriateness of that time? Is it us? Most of the time, it's not us. Most of the time, it's God and His sovereignty who is determining what's the appropriate time is for 
uh, something to occur in our lives. In verse 2, he starts right off with probably the most important appropriate time. The first part of verse 2 <laughs> says, uh, in mine, in the whole one, a time to give birth and a time to die. In Deb, yours says a time to be born, where mine says a time to give birth. Most of the commentaries that I've read said that Beverly's is probably the better translation, where it's talking about a time to be born. Uh, here it talks about a time to give birth. It's looking at it from the standpoint of the woman who is giving birth to the child. And really what Solomon is talking about here is the beginning of a person's life. So the idea of to be born, particularly when it's tied to a time to die, is probably the better translation. Either one's okay, and either one has good points to it. But since we're tying it with dying, it's probably better to think of it as to be born. So there's a beginning and an end of life. We all know that. And who sets the beginning and end of life? In most cases, it's not us. <clears throat> it's God. Unless, and I, I, I guess I could even say even then it's him. But in the case of an accident or war or something, and your life is cut shorter than it would normally be, or illness, I guess we could even say that that's an appropriate time is set by God because he controls everything. Um, the latter part of that says a time to plant and a time to uproot. So, Bill, yes, sir. you got a farm up there. Yes, sir. Would you plant corn in December? No. Nope. Mm -hmm. Would you try to harvest your corn in, let's say, March in the middle of a rainstorm? No. No. And if all the rest of us that plant flowers or flower beds or, you know. There are certain times of the year when you plant. And there are certain times of the year when you harvest. And in Israel, the Middle East, it's really important that you are careful about what season you do it in. Because they don't get rain all year long. You know, when we were in Kenya, we had spring rains, we had fall rains. No rain any other time, generally. So you had to be real careful when you planted and when you harvested because you had to do it in the proper season. Verse 3. A time to kill and a time to heal. Now, the time to kill you can look at in a couple of ways. Personally, I like to look at it as simply stating that everybody dies at some time. But it can also be understood as war. And you're killing as part of war. However, when they look at the word at the end of this, a time to heal, again, at the original Hebrew, the time to heal talks about relationships, healing relationships, not necessarily healing physical injuries. So with that one, I think kind of like war, but more of war between individuals. So there's a time, my translation, if you will, there's a time to fight with your neighbor and there's a time to heal the relationship. That would be my interpretation for it. A time to tear down and a time to build up. Now that's pretty straightforward. There are times when old buildings have to be torn down because they're unsafe. And then you build new ones. Now we like to keep the old ones sometimes if they're safe because of the historical value of them. But there are times when buildings are just unsafe and you need to tear them down and replace them. Verse 4. A time to weep and a time to laugh. Or excuse me, to dance. Pairing that with the previous one. A time to weep, a time to laugh, time to mourn and a time to dance, you kind of have a pair. You know, we've had a lot of instances in Job and in other books where they talk about uh, synonymous parallelism, where they have couplets or words that are paired together 
to make a point. Well, in this case, you have something similar. Time to weep, time to mourn, time to laugh, time to dance. It simply means we all have ups and downs. There are times when we have good things happen to us, and there are times when we have bad things happen to us. There are times when we're happy, and there are times when we're sad. Life is not just, hopefully, one long depressing period or one totally joyful all the time period. There are ups and downs in most people's lives. Verse 5 is interesting. A time to throw stones and a time to gather stones. Again, you can interpret this a couple of ways. When they talk about throwing stones or gathering stones, you know, gathering stones, you'd gather stones to build the house. You know, look up a few verses before and they talk about a time to build. So you'd have to gather the stones to uh, build things. When it talks about scattering thought stones or throwing stones can be interpreted as a, 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 refer, a reference to war because the way they would deny land to um, the enemy is they cover it with stones so they couldn't farm on it. So that's one interpretation. Uh, throw stones can also be viewed in the standpoint of a ju judicial uh, idea. You know, they st stone people to death as a judicial punishment. So it can be looked at it that way too. So there's a time when stones are thrown at somebody and there are also other times when you're gathering stones to your bill. So it's a positive and negative. If you notice, all of these in some ways are positive and negatives. The latter part of that one, a time to embrace and a time to avoid embracing, generally refers to the idea of a married couple. And uh, if you're interested, it probably is in your study guides, they try to make a point that there's evidently some type of old Jewish proverb that when it talks about stones, there's also some type of um, sexual <laughs> connotation to that which I'm not going to get into because I didn't understand it, to be honest with you. But I'm sure it probably says something about that in your study guides. But evidently there's an interpretation that has to do with the embracing as well, which didn't make sense to me. So if it didn't make sense to me, I'm not going to try to talk about it. Um, a time to search and a time to count is lost. Time to keep and a time to throw away. Again, they kind of pair up. Uh, a time to search and a time to count is lost. When we're talking about searching, it can be talking about something that we've lost or something new that we would like to have. Again, depending on how it's interpreted. But there's also a time to count as lost or to give up. In other words, there comes a time when you want something or you've lost something and you've looked, and you've looked, and you've looked, and you can't find it. So there's time to give up and go on to something else. Seven, a time to tear and a time to sew. When we talked before, what did they, when did they tear clothes in this time frame? <clears throat> when a death happens. When a death happens. Death, sorrow, depression. You remember Job? tore his clothes after everything happened to him. But there comes a time when things get better. So there's a time to mend or a time to sew. It's time to put it back together again. A time to be silent and a time to speak. Wise men know that you got two ears and one mouth. So you should listen twice as much as you talk. But there's also a time when a wise person needs to speak up and say the truth. A time to love and a time to hate. Remember, love and hate, the words they use don't just mean the emotions. Love and hate means like the entire being. So pair that with war and peace. So love would be peace 
hate would be war. And again, we're looking at opposites. We got a positive and we got a negative. And it's interesting that sometimes he puts the positive first, sometimes he puts the negative first. And I honestly don't see why, what difference it made with it. Um, none of the commentaries said anything other than the fact that notice he sometimes puts positive first and the negative second, but he does. And again, this is not intended to include everything in a person's life, but I think what he's really trying to get across here is the idea, as he said in verse 1, in that people have appropriate seasons of the year. And we'll come back to this later in Ecclesiastes, because later on he's going to talk about death and dying more. He's going to talk about getting old later on. He talks about these seasons of life throughout the rest of the book. But for right now, I think the point for these eight particular verses is the idea that there's an appropriate time for everything that happens to us and who's in control of it. It's God. Uh, kind of reinforce that. Flip back a few pages in your Bible to Proverbs, excuse me, not Proverbs, Psalms. Verse 31, uh, 30, yeah, Psalms 31, verse 15. And then Psalms 139, verse 16. And this talks about God and his sovereignty over time. So Psalms 31, verse 15 says, The course of my, this is the Holman, the course of my life is in your power. Deliver me from the power of my enemies and from my persecutors. The first part of that, though, the course of my life is in your power. God controls the course of our life. Now, we have the ability to make decisions and to affect what happens in our lives, but the overall arch of our lives is controlled by God. And then 139.16 says, you, Your eyes saw me when I was formless, all my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. So, as we've said before, God doesn't get surprised by anything. He knows what's going to happen in our lives before it happens. We may not understand why in the small picture that we see, but in the big picture, he has the sovereignty <clears throat> over it. So then he goes on to talk about time but in a broader context so we're going to look at verses 9 through 13 so um, Charlie could you read that one for us please 9 through 13 okay. what profit is there to the worker from that in which he toils I have seen the task which God has given the sons of men with which to occupy themselves he has made everything appropriate in its time he has also set eternity in their heart, yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning to the end. I know that there is nothing better for them than to rejoice and to, good, to do good in one's lifetime. Moreover, that every man who eats and drinks sees good in all his labor. It is the gift of God. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. Okay, verse 9. What does the worker gain from his struggles? Kind of pessimistic, isn't it? I mean, he's talked about all these good and bad things that happen to people in the previous eight verses. And there here in verse 9 he says, What does the worker gain from his struggles? I guess I kind of paraphrased it, if you put it in the day's English, and said, Who really controls my life? Do I control it or does God control it? Is it really worth it? You know, last week we talked about what use is it. Is our struggle to get through our daily lives worth it? Are we just following a plan that's been set forth and it's already preordained as to what's going to happen? 
kind of a pessimistic way to look at things. Particularly then you tie in verse 10. I have seen the task that God has given people to keep them occupied. In the New International Version, it says, I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. Again, I have seen. Solomon's reminding us that he's gone back and he's investigated all this stuff. This is not just something he's heard. He's looked at everything that happens to in a person's life. And I have seen that it's all just a burden. And the word here usually has a connotation of pain. It's not just heavy. It's a connotation of life's a pain. It's a hard life. It's really pessimistic. The good news is he gets a second wind. When you look at verse 11, he has put eternity in their hearts, but man cannot discover the work God has done from beginning to end. And again, we've talked about before, in this time frame, they didn't really have an idea of the resurrection or heaven or hell. During this time frame, the idea was when you're dead, you're dead. You go to the place of the dead, the Sheol, and that's it. Life's over. But if you remember Job talked about a hope of seeing God after death. And Solomon here does kind of the same thing. He has put eternity in their hearts. He has put the idea in some people's mind at this time, and we know today we're seeing it from thousands of years in the future. We have a different outlook. But what he's saying here is even people of my time have an idea that there might be more than just the grave, that there might be an eternity. There might be more coming than just what I'm seeing right now. Right now, my life may be the pits, but there's something better coming. And I don't see everything God's going to do from the beginning to the end. Again, think of Job. Job had a wonderful life. Then everything was lost. Then it came back. He had a wonderful life to end. Again, our lives are similar. We have good things happen to us. We sometimes have bad things happen to us. Verse 12, I know there is nothing better for them to rejoice and enjoy the good life. Life has good things and bad things happen to us. But overall, life is given to us by God for our enjoyment. So enjoy the present. Um, I heard somebody once say that the uh, past is, you don't, past is gone, the future still will come, the present is a gift. That's why they call it the present. So look at what's happening now as a gift from God and use it that way. <clears throat> Verses 14 and 15. I know that all God does will last forever. There is no adding to it or taking from it. God works so that people will be in awe of him. Bev, would you read 14 in the New International? 14 in the New International. Yeah. Well, I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that people will fear him. Okay. New International says fear. Holman says awe. This, this New International says revere. Revere, okay. Awe, revere, I think, is for me a better translation than fear. A lot of people, when you think of fear, it's, oh, you know, scared. And really what they're talking about is reverence or awe or acknowledgement that, as we found in the end of Job, he's the creator, we're the creature. 
He's the God, we're the human. And there's a, a difference and we need to acknowledge that God is much more than what we would ever be. And I think sometimes when you re read fear of the Lord or fear God, people get the idea that it's being scared of him. Really, it's just acknowledging him that he's so far above us that we need to be in, maybe maybe I combine reverence awe, reverent awe of him. Is respect too simple of a word? For is this? what? Is respect too simple of a word for is, this? Is respect too sim simple, simple of a word? I just flipped over to the New International Version mm -hmm. a couple of minutes ago looking at that, and that's what it says. Respect him. Okay. Respect for him. What do you think? Is respect too simple a word? It's better than fear. It's better than fear. Bill, I'm just going to give you a top of my head answer. I'm just asking. Okay. Uh, I think respect is part of it, but I think you can respect somebody without being in awe or reverence of them. So I think that's part of the awe and reverence. Well, but respect by it. itself, I think, is too small a word. I agree. I, I think respect is part of it, but there's a lot more to it than just respect. And that's just my off the head answer. Uh, that's, yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. It was just a little. Get out of that whatever is has already been, and whatever will be already is. God repeats what is past. Kind of what I said a minute ago, right? <laughs> Whatever is has already been. Past is past. There's nothing you knew with it. You can regret it. You can be happy about it. But as far as changing it, past is gone. There's nothing you can do with it. Future? God knows what the future is going to be. We don't. Can you change the future? Boy, how many movies have been made about time travel and tr trying to change the past or change the future? I'm a big sci-fi nut. I like all those kind of movies. Um, our decisions today determine what our future is going to be tomorrow. Do we know what those decisions are going to cause? Maybe if we think about it hard enough, we might figure it out. God knows what is going to happen. Because it's written down. I mean, um, whatever will be already is. He already knows what's going to happen. I don't. I try to make my decisions today in the present so that my future is good. And more importantly, so that my future is pleasing to him. And I think if I make that kind of decision today then I will be happy with my future. But that's me. I don't know. God is enduring, complete, and just, and he has control of our lives. Ecclesiastes 3 helps us to remember, like Job does, that we're not the ones in control. The one in control is a sovereign God. And we have to keep our perspective, just like happened with Job, we have to keep our perspective as close as we can get to his perspective. Because as we go through life, we're going to face different seasons of life. Different things are going to happen. And as we go through the rest of the book of Ecclesiastes, we're going to look at things like death and getting old. And I don't know about you, but for me, it was interesting because some of the descriptions when he talks about that, I can look, I can definitely see in my own life. And you'll you'll see what I'm talking about when we get. Those, I think those are the last two chapters in the book deals with death and getting old. But that's something that happens to all of us. You know, go back to. 3 verse 2 there's a time to be born and a time to die God has set beginning and end he knows everything that's going to happen in the middle 
we need to stand in reverent awe and then try to please him and then our lives will be good I didn't say perfect I said our lives will be good okay I think that's all I got this morning um, some of you have notes on the sides anything that your notes say that you have an interest in or something that I didn't mention <clears throat> yes, James. Sure. When we say God is in control, mm -hmm. that's a very difficult thing to understand and easily misinterpreted. And to try to tell a, a young child that God is in control, what does that mean? God causes everything? Does He cause the illness that killed a loved one? He's in control. Did he cause <clears throat> the accident that killed a loved one? It's difficult to understand what we mean by mm -hmm. God is in control. The scripture talks about the prince of this world, Satan, controlling some things. I, I have difficulty with trying to understand and explain when we say God is in control. Yet it, it seems like so much of what happens is because of my actions. And I, I don't say that God is directly controlling my actions. Controlling may be... I go back to Job. Controlling may be a poor choice of words more than maybe using the word allow in that he allows things to happen like he did with Job he allows things to happen that sometimes things happen because of the decisions we made and God allows us to make those decisions I agree with you it's really hard with young people with kids and I Thankfully, I don't think I've ever had to do that with a young child. Um, I guess, and this is in some ways a cop-out answer. I would structure the answer based on the understanding of the person I'm talking to. You know, talking to an adult is different than talking to a 10-year-old when you structure an answer. Um, and beyond that, really, I don't have a good answer for you. I, I, I totally get what you're saying. And I, I think maybe the problem comes from the idea of control versus allow. Because I think with Job, we found that God allows things to happen, either caused by Satan or our own bad choices to have to occur. You know, like Mike was talking this morning. If you make the choice not to wear a seatbelt and you're in a car wreck, that God allowed that to happen, but it was your choice that you didn't wear a seatbelt. Again, for a young child, that's not going to be very comforting. <clears throat> and thank goodness I've never had to address it with a young child. Because I don't know how I would address it. Anybody else? Yeah, Brandy? Um, what I've learned from my experience is my intuition and that little whisper in my head is God, you know, trying to lead me, mm -hmm. but it's my freedom of choice that makes me make the bad decisions. So he's He's trying to be there and to guide you, but mm -hmm. it's up to you if you're going to listen or not. Yeah. Sometimes our conscience is that voice that says, this is what you want to do. We don't always follow yeah. what we ought to do. Anybody else? Okay, let's close with prayer then. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can come together and study your word. Thank you for Ecclesiastes 3. that shows us that life is full of positives and negatives, ups and downs, good and bad. And that while you allow things to happen, our choices sometimes dictate 
what happens. Help us to make choices that reflect our reverent awe of you, that reflect our understanding of your sovereignty, and that as we make choices, may they be pleasing to you. And as we go through the book of Ecclesiastes, help us to see the wisdom that you have put here to understand that the purpose of our lives here is in preparation for our lives in eternity. And that while things do happen, we do have a hope that this is just a prologue. For we ask it in your name. Amen.